So this week with Whale Rider, it's not as impactful as a historical event as maybe some of the things we, we talked about, but this is a part of the world and a country we haven't really talked about yet. We did talk about New Zealand a little bit in regards to them helping the Australian group in Gallipoli, and we've talked about Polynesian peoples, but we haven't talked about the Maori specifically, and I thought it was kind of interesting kind of starting with some of the background before we get into the film itself because the film is not a specific historical event or anything. It's more just about the culture. Yeah. And that New Zealand was very, very, well, maybe not two varies, one very recently colonized by humans. So basically before the 14th century, no one. There was not humans on New Zealand until the Maori arrived in the 1300s, which I just thought was surprisingly recent. And it does seem to be it was kind of the last major island to be colonized by humans, at least in this part of the world. And so the Maori, are they are Polynesian, but having been isolated for several hundred years on New Zealand, they did develop their own unique culture and something kind of recognizable today as uniquely Maori and different from other Polynesian peoples. So unlike some of these other countries, they hadn't been isolated as long before the Europeans showed up. So the Europeans show up just, you know, a, a few hundred years after they had been on New Zealand themselves. And there was one, I guess, kind of bad encounter at first, and the Europeans didn't come back for a while. What what happened with that? It was I forget I forget which country they were from, but it was just like a small group showed up. The Maori actually attacked and killed some of them, and then they just left mm-hmm. and didn't okay. come and didn't come back until Cook came back because Cook was just kind of the guy over the whole world, literally. And so that kind of did lead to the more permanent colonization, and everything kind of happened quickly, though. So. There was definitely conflicts with the Europeans, but it it really didn't take long for them. Man, this is definitely oversimplifying, and I don't want to disregard the conflicts that did take place. But I feel like it wasn't like centuries of strife, it doesn't seem like. It was, yes, there was conflict, but within, you know, less than 100 years, they're setting up a system by which the Europeans and the Maori are coexisting, and there's a constitution, basically, that takes them all into account. Now, yes, there was an issue with the guy who translated the treaty from English into Maori didn't really speak Maori that well, so the Maori were maybe agreeing to things that weren't true from the British point of view, Mm -hmm. and so there's definitely some conflicts with all that stuff, but it's kind of even since, since the late 19th century even, it's been a very progressive and welcoming country. It was like one of the first, if not the first country in the world to allow women to vote. They've been very anti-nuclear from the beginnings of the nuclear age. And that's may cause some issues with some things or with uh, even like, say, South Africans wanting to come play rugby there. They were right from the beginning protesting, nope, not until you get rid of racism in your country. So like, it's just been a very Mm -hmm. standing up for kind of what's right before maybe the rest of the world caught up to the New Zealand way of saying things. And then also the phrase, I just watched the YouTube video kind of <laughs> real quickly about their history. And the phrase that used a couple of times was punching above their weight, that New Zealand, despite a low population, just tends to kind of have a positive, disproportionately positive impact on the rest of the world from the kind of things I mentioned, or basically sending if I had the numbers right, it was almost like a tenth of their population they sent to fight in World War One or something ridiculous like that, or World War Two. Oh so wow! Just, and so just kind of always quote again, punching above their weight, and just a very you know proud people, proud to be from New Zealand, but not in like a a negative nationalistic way where they want to try to flex their muscle. It's more just like we're we're, we're proud right. of who we are and where we come from. And then the phrase that they kind of say is the the common New Zealand greeting that the it's a Maori phrase that so there's the the New Zealand people who are not of Maori descent they actually have a term for that that is actually far too close to the name of our character here today so I kind of want to say it a little right here it's like Paikia is the name of our main character here today but it's like Paikia is the name for European New Zealanders so it's, it's okay. It's really similar. So I'm probably trying to going to try to avoid saying it, but it is the kind of the two, you know, groups there. Yeah, and more recently, New Zealand has been in the news for being like one of the countries to best handle the COVID nineteen pandemic. That's absolutely correct because they just kind of real quickly said, "Nope, here's the best way to do it. We're all on board." Yeah, at, at the very beginning, they they kind of the entire country 
got behind the idea of a super intense national quarantine and mask wearing. And I think today they have almost none. They might even be literally zero new cases like daily. Yeah, as of as of a week or two ago, I'm pretty sure they hit zero new cases, at least on a couple day stretch there. And like their their schools are all opening up in the fall. No issues like they're. Yeah, just uh, food for thought, United States. (laughs) Exactly. Fake country. No New Zealand. (laughs) (laughs) So so the, the, the phrase they use, let me see if I can pull it back up here. Yeah, uh, Kiora, and I think they say it in the movie, maybe, but I didn't have subtitles on, so when they were saying Maori stuff, there's sometimes where maybe I didn't know if they were saying something in Maori or something in English with a Maori accent or New Zealand accent, but a, a common phrase, I guess, that they use in New Zealand that the white New Zealanders, the Peikia, have picked up on is this Kiora, and it just basically, it's almost kind of like a namaste in India kind of thing, where it just kind of says like, Hello, you're welcome here. I acknowledge and recognize everyone you come from and where you come from, and you have a friend here. Like, it's just kind of all that sentiment in Kia ora. And so I guess it's just like the thing to say in in New Zealand is kind of like a friendly hello when you run across somebody. And again, they probably do say it in the movie, and I just kind of ignored it because I wasn't sure what they were saying, but just kind of now looked that up. So... This is a film that I mentioned to you I really, really love, and you had not seen before, and it was probably my fourth or fifth time watching it, and I just straight up cried the whole thing this time. Like, I just love, (laughs) love, love this movie so much, and it's not like we talk about like a Hotel Rwanda where you're crying because it's like the the horror. This is more like the beauty and the sentiment of the relationship of this girl with her grandfather specifically Mm -hmm. is just so beautiful. And I think it just works. And then of course, again, having seen it now, you know, four or five times where I know what's coming and I just think it's so beautifully set up and developed that because I've seen it more times, I'm actually crying more. Like the first time through is probably just the scene you had mentioned in a text to me about her giving the speech for her grandfather who didn't show up. Yeah. At the, at the school program, that scene, uh, yeah, that, that it messed me up because she, I mean, for people who haven't seen it, basically she gets up and she she won some contest for like her school or for their province or something right? about um, a speech. And she gave a speech and it was both in, I don't know what, is that Maori? Is that the name of the language? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, we'll, we'll go with that. There could be specific dialects within that, but yeah, right. yeah it's so a Maori she, language, in, yeah. Yeah, in a Maori language, she gave a speech, and then she also, you know, gave a speech about her grandfather, and then did this like traditional chant that she dedicated to her grandfather, who's not there. He didn't show up because um, he was he was bummed that none of the boys that he was trying to teach to be chief were able to get the whale tooth. But he was still on his way. He was still on his way on that one, though. Be- and then the, he ran to the beach well, he- whales on his way there. Oh, that's right. That's right. But ch- so so he's not. He wasn't there at this the school presentation which is also like it it makes it doubly sad because the whole time she's like she goes in and like gives him a little card that says like you're my guest of honor for the school program and the uh when they first show up her grandma is talking about like she said i I, you know i don't know if your grandfather's gonna make it and she says no he'll be here Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then he's he's not there (laughs) right and uh yeah so she gives this whole this whole speech and does the chant and everything and she's like she's like trying so hard not to cry but like is basically bawling the entire time right right and then you as the viewer are just i'm gonna cry right now i love this movie so much because right yeah i I, I dare you to watch a (laughs) 10 year old keisha castle hughes you know dedicating a chant to her grandfather and bawling her eyes out i dare you to watch that without feeling anything (laughs) right right you're dead inside (laughs) so uh, so backtracking Again, the movie itself is is not historical, but it it is representative, and I do want to get into it. And what I kind of, I guess, I always kind of noticed it, but it really, it really, really just was highlighted for me this time through how much this is darn near like a fantasy, as far as of her being like the destined queen who's the granddaughter of the king who thinks women can't rule. Like, it's almost like a there's like a fantasy element to it for me 
that she's yeah. like that like basically he's looking for the prophesized you know heir to the quote throne and right. ignoring and she's and she's clearly it right but he's just won't admit that his daughter his granddaughter can be the leader that their kingdom will quote unquote needs and then we right. kind of know it's coming but as we kind of get and it kind of builds and builds and builds and builds to the point that when he finally realizes I'm getting chills right now when he finally realizes Oh my gosh, the signs were there. And again, it's a spiritual thing. It's not just like, oh, I'm a dummy. My 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 granddaughter should be our leader. It's like, no, for him it's a spiritual moment when he realizes mm-hmm. the mistakes and how he's been blind to the signs that were all pointing to how obvious it was that this girl is destined to be the leader or the chief of their tribe. And again, I'm going to cry yeah. right now. I love this movie so much. And it's, it really is mostly, it, honestly, it, it kind of is about misogyny and the role of women in leadership as and juxtaposed against the Maori culture and one that may have been kind of not necessarily strictly misogynistic, but definitely patriotic as far in the sense of male dominated. Is that who's that? He's going use the term patriotic is it, or patri- patriarchal, I guess I should patriarchal. say. Patriarchal. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, yeah, I like to add syllables in there. <laughs> so yeah, so the opening of the movie is, well, one, it's her talking about the history of the Maori people. And so we already kind of talked about their Polynesian people that came to New Zealand in the 1300s. Well, the the story within the movie, and it does seem to be kind of, there's different legends with different tribes, but yes, roughly speaking, it is kind of believed that there was this one guy, Paikia, who was basically struggling to get there and finally made it to New Zealand with the help of a whale and came in riding a whale. And he kind of then became, with it for this particular tribe, you know, they are then descended from this actual Paikia. And so at the beginning of the movie, we see the main girl born as her mom dies in childbirth. And she also has a twin brother who died during the labor. So all that's left is her dad and her. And then her grandfather, who's the chief of their community, is basically ignoring the fact that it's a girl and says, hey, don't worry, you'll have another son at some point. And and the son is like, I just lost my wife and my son. Maybe this girl's enough. And you know what? We're going to name the girl Paikia after our ancient ancestor, first chief of our tribe. And the grandpa is just like, the hell you are. That name is sacred. You don't give it to a girl because we're looking for the next chief. And her dad is still around but lives over in Europe and is kind of an artist and dating a white girl. And so he's basically kind of like almost in, I think it was think of Lord of the Rings, especially because we're in New Zealand here in kind of an Aragorn way. He separated himself from his. So he basically is taking himself out of the line of succession, I guess you would say. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's just kind of then the relationship between this granddaughter and grandfather. And he's looking for the next leader of the tribe while the granddaughter is checking off all the boxes. She's just, kicking butt in everything that, that her grandpa has the boys do and he just yep. won't have it and just doesn't even want her trying to do these things. Yeah. Including like they have the um the Tayaha. Mm, the, yeah, uh, the staff. The, the staff. So she like tries to learn it. The grandfather won't teach it to her. So then she goes and seeks out it's like her uncle or something. Right. Or or just you know, a, a family friend who was like a champion of it back in the day and has him teach her how to use it and then goes and practices with one of the boys and beats him and it was her grandfather's favorite boy who she kind of had like earmarked as oh this will probably be the chief and then once his daughter right. granddaughter beats him he's like nope you, you're out of the running yep and something i didn't notice somehow the first times through completely but the idea that they keep showing this old giant boat there's a specific name for them they're like those long skinny boat boats when you think of polynesian countries they call it um, a waka. Yes. It's like a like the canoe. Yeah, but like probably 40 but, feet right, long. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, I, I say canoe, but it sits, yeah, it sits like 25 people. Right. And, there, you know, like a dozen dudes on each side rowing. Right, Like it's right. huge. Maybe even longer than that. But yeah. And so we keep seeing it in the background. It's kind of this boat that's kind of disrepair. And she mentions, mentions it being her father's boat. And... I really didn't notice how often they kind of pointed back to it in the background or you would see it being neglected or when she's standing on it looking out over the beach as the whales are uh, have beached themselves and how mm-hmm. then then that's they don't quite necessarily spoon feed you. But isn't that then the same boat? They're all on the end at, at the end. Yes. No doubt? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So that. Yeah. So just, and again, it's, there's definitely a fantasy element. You, you could basically do this exact same story and set it in some fantasy world. And it would be not more impactful, but just like all the tropes kind of just fit perfectly yeah. in line with this destined queen. And and that 
that Canute that was being that was like the that was going to be Pykea's father's gift to her twin brother who uh, died. Oh, okay. He okay. was building it for the for the brother. That's what it was. Okay, I missed that. Okay, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And yeah, just kind of this, the whole everything is like going perfectly, and then until it isn't, and and uh, and yeah, that was that was her uncle actually, because that's the the teen the teenager who holds her at the beginning when she's born. That's the same uncle who then okay. gets gets uh gets they kind of tease him for getting fat and stuff. But yeah, and so and then specifically too within their village, I don't know what you would call it. It's just kind of their rural area here. And it's, they're kind of mm-hmm. poverty stricken, but they're not, they're not starving or anything. It's just kind of a poor community of Maori. Right. But the, the grandpa kind of talks about, they've fallen on hard times recently. And in his mind, things really tanked and got worse for their community when Paikia was born. Mm-hmm. So he kind of even then half in his mind thinks almost that maybe she's responsible for some curse or that it, whether it was the death of her brother at birth, or the the fact that her father basically abandoned his role in the community that just there's, there's been this curse that they've been living under ever since she was born, which is kind of part of the reason he's kind of always poo pooing her too. But even though they love each other and do have this close bond, but when it comes to their role in the community, he's like, yeah, but you're a girl and this just isn't for you, even though I love you. Yeah, that's that was another thing too. Is like you, it's it's not like a typical oh, my grandfather blames me for this stuff, so he hates me. Like, he cares for her, and she, and knows she loves him, right. and, and he loves her, right. And, you know, like, like it shows him, you know, riding riding his bike, and she'll, like, sit on the handlebars or whatever. Like, yes. they have a good relationship, but... It, it doesn't extend to this other part of his life. Right, he's kind of, like, compartmentalizing between, yes. like, yes, obviously, I, of course I love and care for my granddaughter, but she will she will never ever be the chief of our people. That's just out of the question. But right. that doesn't mean that I don't love her. It just right. means that that's not she has a different what role. her future right. holds. Yeah, yeah. So and I was looking at so this movie is a ninety one percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and I was getting very very mad at that nine percent of critics. What I did see though is they basically said, yeah, it's just so predictable. And you know what? I guess I'll kind of give them that to a point that you know the grandpa is going to realize at the end that he is wrong. Yeah, sure. That's predictable. But you know what? They earn it every step of the way. It's not cheesy. I, I don't know about the predictability of the actual ending, though. And I agree. And, and I agree. And I was going to say that, that too. Yes. Is, I would like, you know, you see her grab onto the whale and, and go onto the water. And I'm like, what 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 just happened? Right, right. And it, is it, she it, drowning? It keeps going. Yeah. I'm yeah, and then they, you know, they they show the big canoe and everything. I'm like, oh shit, like this is her funeral. Right. And then all of a sudden, like they just cut and she's just there. Right. So yeah. So screw you, critics who don't give this a thumbs up. <laughs> but yeah, the, the predictability of her grandma being wrong, but you still don't know beyond that to what extent or how his wrongness is going to manifest itself and what what's going to happen to Pikea herself. So yeah, there's so much you don't right. know, and it's so ro- so rewarding. And they just, again, I do think they kind of set it up beautifully where it doesn't seem forced. And it's just kind of one quote unquote test at a time. And when he has the boys dive in after his whale tooth necklace and none of them can come up with it. And then, you know, the next day or a week later, whenever Pikey is out with her uncle on the water and it's like, oh, is this about where they were? I'll go get it. And then she yep. brings up the necklace that was supposed to be like, who is the next chief? And then the uncle gives it to the grandma and mm-hmm. it's like, well, you're gonna are you gonna tell him? You're gonna tell Grandpa? And uh, she's like, nope, he's not he's not ready yet. And of course, all this is when a New Zealand accent. This and is- <laughs> see, that was like the one thing in this movie that I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, you didn't think like, so? Why would she? No, I was like, why, why, why not? Like, why would you keep that? Because it was the, kind of the point where that he was the most upset with his with everything that he was he, he was kind of the most destitute and it was he wasn't in a mindset where this was going to cheer him up it would probably just piss him off more i think that i think oh, she so, was right so the grandma is saying well he needs to figure like without this he needs to figure it out and then this will be like the cherry on top to Kinda. Like, be the final nail in the coffin of his i think so right is not wanting her to be chief right he's almost seeing pikea as this jonah so to speak for the whole community and he basically had given up that he was ever going to be able to find a chief. So yes, you could be like to say that's the perfect time, but he was still kind of he was grieving over that realization that he was never going to find a chief with these boys. So oh, I, I, okay. I think he was kind of at his lowest point, and then so anyway, gotcha. yeah. So then he runs. So then he still is coming out of his funk to go see the concert or whatever her her reading, and then gets distracted by all these beached whales that have. Yeah. And again, and again, keep in mind. 
for this tribe, whales are sacred because that's how they saw their ancestors as having come to New Zealand in the first place. So the fact that there's half a dozen beached whales, I mean, they're literally crying as they're trying to figure out how to save these whales from dying on the beach. And yeah, yeah, so after the concert thing, they all kind of realize what's going on and then they're trying to help the whales, but they kind of can't do much about it. And there's kind of the one that they realize is kind of like the alpha whale, their leader. And yeah, so they can't even tow it with the tractor. And then finally, Pikea herself, as everyone walks away, gets on top of the whale. And she is the motivating factor that gets the whale to kind of want to live again, kind of. And again, all the other whales follow. And then she's off in the ocean. And again, so there's, it's kind of just built up to that she's destined to rule. And then the grandpa sees that. And then grandma shows the whale tooth necklace that she reclaimed. And he's like, well, which one grabbed this? And then grandma is about to rip his head off. It's just like, what do you mean, which one? you know the whole yep. time who was destined to yep. be the next chief and you just wouldn't admit it to yourself. And then he says like, okay, my granddaughter is literally riding the alpha whale, saved the whales, got the tooth. Yep. And just the look on his face of, oh my gosh. He's basically, it's like, forgive me, Lord, for what I have done kind of thing. The Maori version. Yeah. And just like, I was the one being tested this whole time. That's what he realizes in that moment that I was the one failing the test. I now see it. I'm going to embrace right. this new moment for our tribe that we are going to have a female chief. And I was wrong. And again, I'm getting chills. I just love this movie so much. And I do, I do think they earn it every bit along the way. But yes, it, this isn't a specific historical thing, but it's still representative of this culture. And for those who aren't super familiar, you've probably seen Maori stuff, especially, you know, with context of the Olympics or something. But it's they tend to have the very cool black tribal tattoos and they do the kind of warrior dances with the open face and and you know sticking the tongue out which the grandpa even talks yeah. about is it's part of an intimidation thing it's basically telling your mm-hmm. enemy that you know, i'm literally going to eat you yeah and like all of the of the like new zealand national sports teams do it but like the most famous one is their rugby team the all blacks they do the haka before and mm. there's like tons of youtube videos if you just go on okay. youtube and type in like haka h-a-k-a and you know all blacks Okay. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty cool it is pretty intimidating because no, not yes. only is the dance itself intimidating but they're also like really good at rugby so it's like <laughs> this is us intimidating you before we're about to just crush you absolutely yeah and of course yeah there's always these muscular guys with these tribal tattoos mm-hmm. and... yeah a bunch of dudes that look like the rock <laughs> basically yeah yeah <laughs> and it's one of those things where like man i would it'd be so cool to have like a maori tattoo but that's kind of one where like nah you you kind of have to be maori to get a maori tattoo or it's almost insulting it'd be like getting the olympic rings right. tattooed on you if you're not an olympian it's like no you you yeah. you haven't earned that tattoo you don't deserve that tattoo so right maori tattoos should be reserved for the maori people but man they're cool <laughs> <laughs> that's really about probably all i had New Zealand this day is a place I have not yet visited, but would love oh, to. It's, it's it for looks... sure in like my top three, right? Definitely top five, probably top three of the places I want to go. And and honestly, it's it's like a lot of it is influenced by being such a huge fan of the Lord of the Rings movies and watching yes. them so much. Like yes. growing up, it's like it's basically this like a ten hour New Zealand tourism commercial <laughs> because of like every landscape you see it's like oh yeah that's not that's not a middle earth that's not like a fantasy realm that's all real you can go see it it's all in new zealand right right and you watch the special features on the lord of the rings it's kind of interesting to see how like okay yeah so in this shot here we added the little ruins that are fantasy but the whole right. background vista yeah <laughs> that's all just... the, all the mountains yeah. and hills yeah everything it's it, you can go see all of that yeah it's gorgeous and you know, kind of one of those geothermic hotspots, kind of like an Iceland, but, you know, down in the southern, southern hemisphere. And they do have issues with earthquakes and stuff that have hit recently. But it's, yeah, a beautiful place that I would love to go visit. And I definitely have a predilection for the, the Maori culture I find fascinating and important. And, that, and so I, I, there's a kind of one last thing worth mentioning here is they've done a good job of kind of making sure they stay strong and remember their cultural heritage. There was kind of a dip in the early 1900s where their population was kind of falling. There's maybe a little risk that they might get too absorbed into the European culture, but they've kind of done a good job. Again, they they do seem to all get along mostly, but they have made a decided effort to preserve that Maori history and culture and Mm -hmm. their, their numbers have rebounded and and there's a lot more of the cultural stuff that maybe like in the in the 50s, it might have been harder to find a lot of these cultural things and and yeah. things like doing the doing the the dances and the warrior dances at the rugby matches. They probably wouldn't have occurred yeah. to them 60 years ago. And now they're making a point to right. kind of keep those things alive. 
Yeah, and that's that's something that I I kind of wish like it's too late now. Like I I don't know if it'll ever happen, but I think it would be cool, you know, to see more of a cultural like joining hands, if you will, between like in the United States between native people and European settlers, which the history is obviously completely different here than it is there. Right. And they did have their issues there, but right, not like we had here where we basically we just we don't they don't have the numbers. We got their numbers too low here. They can't even thrive like the Maori are. Yeah. But yes, it would be nice to see that. Yeah, I feel like it's tough. I, I, and I, I'd be curious, I guess, what the European population of New Zealand, how they see it, and if they kind of feel that similar kind of pride. But I almost feel like here, when you see a traditional Native American event of any kind, it feels, oh, awkward is not the right word, but it, it just feels so other and out of place. And just mm-hmm. like, it, it just, we have no connection to it. Like kind of to your point, though, it would be nice to get that back and at least yeah. recognize that, hey, no, that's not our ancestors, but those people's ancestors we're here first and right. this land we're living on and growing our food on was their land. And there's maybe an homage we could pay to that and kind mm-hmm. of be united in that uh, appreciation right. for the history. You're right. It would be neat to see something like that here. So uh, last week, this week and next week, we're all staying right around the year 2000 roughly. And then next week we're going to deal with something we haven't really talked about much yet on this timeline, the war on drugs with the 2000 film Traffic by Steven Soderbergh.